Hello, family. Thank you so much for joining us for another Every Nation online service. My name is Andy Limdingani, and I'm so excited, so happy that you could join us. Listen, there's still time, so grab a Bible, call a friend, and make a cup of whatever it is you drink, tea or coffee, it doesn't matter. With that said, buckle up, listen up, and take notes. Welcome, family, to week number seven of our sermon series called Miracles. If you missed out on the last six, I highly encourage you, please, please take a moment to go watch. Now, such a profound and a significant statement is that we do not seek God for the miracles. We seek Him for who He is and not what He can do. And this is fundamental to understand from the get-go because John writes about miracles as signs and wonders pointing to God and who he is. And therefore, I think it is good for us to have that stirred up in our hearts already from the beginning. Now, something I've come across is that we live in a dark world and there's always bad news. And it's always hard sometimes to see the miracles on the daily. But when it comes to miracles that we read on scripture, in scripture, that we find that Jesus performed, I feel sometimes we can often lose the awe and the reverence of how significant and how powerful the miracle actually really is. And I really want to encourage us as we're going into this story that it will stir something in your heart about, wow, if God could do it then, he can do it even now. Now, I want to start with this story, which I really found quite funny, but at the same time, really interesting. So a young man by D.L. Moodley was suddenly called upon to go render a funeral sermon. Now, he searched in scripture, in the Bible, to find one of Jesus's sermons. And to his disappointment, his search was in vain. Because he found that every funeral that Christ was invited to was broken up. Death could not exist where Jesus was. And when death heard his voice, life came back. And Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life, making two very profound statements that we're going to identify and read into in this story. So just a little note, the origin of death. When God created humans, he created us not to be subject to death. But when sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all mankind because all have sinned. So the power of resurrection rested on Jesus. And this is what we're going to see when we see the power of eternity with God and what he had come to do on this earth. Now, the biggest flex in the Bible is that death is not the final destination. So you can turn, flip, or scroll to your Bibles to John chapter 11. So we're going to read a big portion of scripture. That's why we're here. And it's going to be awesome because I really hope it'll just be a fresh, fresh breath of the word in your life. Now, we're going to be talking about the death of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus in Hebrew means God has helped, which is quite funny about the conclusion of his story of how God has helped this man come back to life. Then from verse 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, which means house of affliction or house of figs, in a village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary was whose brother Lazarus is now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Now note this. They sent word informing Jesus that the one whom you love is sick. And when Jesus had heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Laz- now Jesus loved Ma- Lazarus, Martha, and their sister. And when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he decided to stay two more days where he was. Now, this is quite interesting. So Jesus gets word that one of his good friends is sick. 
And then Jesus comes and gives us kind of like a, a, a plot twist of this is how the story is actually going to end. He says the sickness will not end in death. No, but it is for God's glory that the Son of God may be glorified. And then he decided to stay two more days. Now, if ever you've encountered urgent message or somebody sent you like something is happening at home, please come now. The natural response of, I would say, the normal human being would, to, would be to get up and actually go to where help is needed. But what we see is Jesus' response here is very different. I don't know about you, but I, I have this unique response to actually get up and go. <laughs> so it's usually hard to respond in, sit down, think, process before you respond. Now, where Jesus was, was about a day's journey from Bethany. So he wasn't quite far from actually going to where trouble was. But he decided to stay two more days. And fast forward into the story, we end up finding that Lazarus actually ends up dying. But something interesting about this, because sometimes you might feel like Jesus is very late, like his delay is the conclusion and the final and the end. But what we see about this specific delay was it was not because Jesus didn't love Lazarus. The delay was motivated by his love for him. And the situation had become so intense on the other side where the family was that the outcome would be so undoubtedly God glorifying. And that's where we see the breath of God come into this story. So I want to take us into biology class 101. Um, if you're in matric or in high school or if you ever studied biology, I think this might kind of be taking you a bit of a, a throwback. So I want to to talk a little bit about the human anatomy. What happens when a person dies? And I want us to bookmark this because it's going to make more sense when we go into the story. The human decomposition process is the breakdown of tissue. This is a little bit graphic, but stay with me. This decomposition varies because of several factors. It could be the weather, temperature, moisture, cause of death, even the body position. Now there's four stages. The first one happens within the period of the first to about four days, which is all of these stages in total. And the first one is autolysis, the self-digestion. It begins immediately after death. There's no blood circulation, respiration stops, and body membranes start to rapture. The second one, the body starts to bloat. This consists of all of the skin discoloration starting to happen and insect activity can be present. And there's an extremely unpleasant odor. Then stage number three is the active decay. Now the organs, the muscles, the skin becomes liquefied. Now this is where all the soft tissue decomposes, the hair, the bone, the cartilage, and decay starts to happen. Now back in the day, um, embalming process used to be part of the, the funeral and part of the, the culture that happened there. So this process would delay the decomposition from happening quicker. Or happening rapidly, but it would still happen in due time. Now, as we pick up, bookmark that last section, book, bookmark it, stay with me. So in verse seven, it goes on and says, and then Jesus said this to his disciple, let us go back to Judea. But they responded, Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back. Then Jesus answered, are they not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Now, this is quite interesting because in Mark chapter 5, we read about Jairus' daughter, who's 12, that Jesus also refers to her being asleep. But then we also know how that story ended, where he rose her and brought her back to life. In verse 12, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. They were thinking about literal sleep. And Jesus had been speaking of Lazarus' death, but his disciples only meant or caught natural sleep. Now then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. We fast forward into a conversation between Jesus and the sisters, Martha. And this is going to be looking at the family aspect. So now a funeral has been in process. Everyone is mourning. Everyone's gathering. They're all at Mary and Martha and Lazarus's home, supporting the family. So Martha sees Jesus coming along and she runs to him. She says, Lord, 
If you had been here, my brother would have not died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha's brother had passed and she had hoped that Jesus would have been there. But even in the midst of seeing the crisis and having that small hint of hope, even when doubt is persistent, she's saying, Lord, I know if you ask God to do something, he will. Then Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Jesus is telling her the outcome of the situation too. It's going to happen. Something is about to happen. But Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus was not talking to her about the second coming. Jesus was telling her about what was about to happen right now. And then we pick up on this statement again. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die physically. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die in their spirit. The I am, the first time we read about the specific two words is in the beginning where God introduces himself to Moses by saying, I am is who is sending you to go set the captives free in Egypt. And Jesus is making a profound claim here by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is saying there is no resurrection apart from him. And there is no eternal life apart from him either. He's giving us a glimpse of his divine nature that he does more than just give life. He is life itself. And therefore, death has no ultimate power over him. Then Jesus continues the conversation and he says to Martha, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who came into this world. And now as Jesus is going further into this context of seeing grief, of seeing pain, of seeing sorrow, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along her were also weeping, Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit. And this is Mary now. And then Jesus says, where have you laid him? Asking, where is Lazarus? I don't know how many of us are often quick in a funeral to ask where the casket is or to ask where the tomb is. But you see, Jesus is not afraid of proximity. He's not afraid of coming close to the things that are dead and the things that are seemingly hopeless. He's not afraid to come there. And in verse 35, the very shortest verse in the Bible that shows such a profound nature of God's humanity in feeling in our suffering as well, Jesus wept. And this is not just ugly cry. And this is not just three or four tears. He wept. He felt the grief. He felt the sorrow. He was compassionate to the extent of suffering with the people that were there. We see the humanity of Jesus, fully man, fully God. And yet he expressed how deeply and strongly he felt about the sorrow that the people and his friends were suffering. But this, he also expressed his anger towards the evil of death. But yet the awe of God's power triumphing over death. When he says, take me to where he is, bring me to the tomb. This is where we see a hint of Jesus walking towards what he's about to do. Imagine going through the process of grief and yet having the knowledge that the resurrection and the joy that is about to come will follow suddenly. In verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Now, if you know about Jesus' story, this is a big parallel that we're picking up on what happened in his story. Then Jesus said, take away the stone. This is where Jesus is inviting community. He is powerful enough to say, stone, move away. And the stone would probably roll away. And yet here, we see something profound. Jesus inviting people to partner with him in seeing this miracle happen. We're seeing a humanly element partner with the divine nature of God. He invites us to partner with him, especially when it comes to miracles. But then Martha interjects and she says, but Lord, by this time there's a bad odor for he has been in there for four days. Remember the biology class before that we bookmarked? We're bringing it back here. 
that whole process of the human decomposition has already happened and he's been there for four days. He's a dead, 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 dead man. But this is what Jesus says. Did I not tell you to believe? You will see the glory of God. So they took the stone. They obeyed. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that it is you who sent me. And when Jesus had said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. His voice holds power to call dead things back to life. When Jesus spoke, even Lazarus' dead body obeyed. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped in stripes of linen and a cloth around his face. And then Jesus invited community yet again. He said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus was brought back to life, but he was still bound. People had to come around him and wrap him and cover him, clothe him and welcome him back to life. This new life, when we're walking with Christ, is, a com- is accompanied by new garments as well. Where the old is gone and the new has come, the process is not just a physical clothing. There's a spiritual covering that needs to come as well. Where once he was bound, even by death, he's now alive and walking in freedom. And he's invited to relationship with Jesus the one who has called him out of the kingdom of darkness in the tomb, in the grave, out of darkness, he's now walking in light. And yet Jesus extends the invitation because the people that covered Lazarus after walking out of the grave was his community, was his family. Man, we see such a profound part and a divine nature of God's holiness, of his holy will that is taking place here. His omnipotentness, that his voice in the, in the coming age, will be the one to summon the world back into resurrection. Now, Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we see this, how Jesus called Lazarus back to life. But the story closely mirrors the story of Jesus' crucifixion, where he was crucified and three days later was risen from the grave. It's so profound. Lazarus was called out of the grave which symbolizes or even metaphorically says there's some things even in our lives that Jesus wants to come and bring back to life. Where circumstances and situations have hindered and pressed in death, Jesus wants to come bring life back into our souls, into our spirits, back into our lives again. Now Lazarus was brought back to life, but he was not left there. His garments of death were removed and he was clothed anew. In John 12, fast forward, verse 2, Brother Lazarus was having dinner and reclining at the table. Now, if you know anything about um, the black culture, we have an after tears after we've gone to the grave and laid the people, laid the person down. We go to the family. That's where the fellowship happens, where there's words exchanged, comfort is exchanged, but also there's a meal that is shared. Now, at this after tears, it's quite odd. Imagine you being Lazarus, now being raised from the dead, going to your own after-death party, but now you're alive. It's a mixture of emotions. I'm pretty sure would be going through a lot. It would have been awkward attending your own after tears, seeing your own picture, and everyone was grieving for you for the last four days. Now it's like rejoicing and kind of... Okay, this is, this is real. This is happening. But he was having lunch at his own after tears, which is just the point I wanted to make. Now, I just want to pull in a parallel. Now, Jesus restored Lazarus back to life in full knowledge that he too will have to pay with his own life to save many. This miracle prefigures Jesus' own triumph over death through his resurrection The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is now the same spirit that lives in both you and I. 
as the last miracle that he performs in his life, it paves way for his own resurrection. With detail of the stone rolling away from the tomb and also Jesus prevailing over death. Now in John 15 verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus laid down his own life for us, his friends, for many that will still come to know him and become his friends. Because here's the power of seeing Lazarus been, been called out of the grave and seeing Jesus' resurrection is that we do not worship a dead God. <laughs> we don't worship a dead Jesus. He's alive. He's a risen king seated at the right hand of the Father. In Romans 6, verse 8, I love how Paul writes this. He says, but if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been risen from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. And then we read in Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1, verse 18, Jesus says, behold, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death in Hades. Jesus was not called out of the grave. He was risen from the grave. And it might feel like there's grave moments in our lives happening right now that really need Jesus to come speak life over, to call them out of the grave. Jesus wants to clothe us with new garments, but it needs us to be willing to be at close proximity with him to bring those things back to life. There's parts of our lives that are that Jesus is calling us to surrender because only he can bring life to, to those things. It might be a spouse who's lost in the faith. That might be metaphorically your Lazarus. It might be a situation of health where it feels like, God, I've been praying for this thing and it feels like nothing is happening. It feels like it has decomposed to the point of beyond recognition. It's not recognizable anymore. Don't be afraid of proximity with an almighty God who can do the impossible, even for you right there where you are right now. There's a thing that we're going through as a family where we're trusting God for divine healing. Now, statistically, it looks like an impossibility, like the statistics are really against us, but we're not looking at the facts of this world to tell us what the reality of God is going to be. We're looking towards the reality of God to say, Lord, we're speaking your word into our circumstance and your word will return to you accomplishing everything it is sent forth. So God, we're choosing to trust you. So as you're speaking life and saying, I'm bringing this back to life. I'm bringing restoration back to life. I'm bringing family reconciliation back to life. I'm bringing old marriages that have not been restored back to life. We're willing to trust God to do that for us and for our families, for our family members. Because death is not the end. It is not the final destination. I mentioned the flex in the beginning, that death for us is just the beginning. So I really just want to invite us to pray for whatever Lazarus, metaphorically, you might be standing with or against or that is in front of you right now. I want us to invite the presence of God to come speak life into that space. For the Lord to revive our hearts yet again. Because there's three things that we can see in this picture. That it is the disciples that Jesus said it is for their benefit that they may believe why this is happening. And they believed because they saw the resurrection. The second was in family. Mary and Martha and everyone, relatives that was with them mourning and comforting them. Jesus also came and breathed life over them. He fellowshiped with them. He grieved with them. And yet the miracle also was performed with them participating. And the third we see is community. The power of being covered and clothed even when we're going through our difficult seasons. It is important, family, to invite friends to be with you in this time if you're going through a hard time. But I also want to invite you, if you really need prayer and are going through something of this nature, please contact us. We want to pray with you. We want to fellowship with you. We want to stand with you as a community of believers and cover you in this time as well. So I just want to pray. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you, Lord, that the evidence of what you've done for Lazarus 
was something that showed us what would happen with you when you died for the sins of many so that many may also come to live in eternity with you with forgiven sins but with righteousness restored i really pray god right now as we're reading this word for those that are waiting for the miracle to happen that you are with them right now i pray that their hearts will be comforted in the knowledge of knowing that there is a god who understands and there is a god who knows every single detail but there is a god who also sees and a god who responds on his word so may, may we be diligent with professing your word over situations that are seemingly dead that are hopeless may we bring the proximity of your word to those situations and profess and declare that there is life and life in abundance in Jesus name so i thank you right now lord as you covering those that are grieving those that are mourning that you are not blinded by hurt but that you that you come and you comfort and you protect their weakness and that you will turn it for strength because in a moment lord god only you can change things and we believe that you can if you could do it for lazarus for mary and martha and all of those that were there thank you god that you can do it for us too even now thank you that miracles are not things of the past but thank you that miracles are things even for now and we trust you god to see them happen even in our lives thank you for the miracle of the breath in our lungs that is how close the miracle is is the very breath in our lungs but i thank you god that you come to heal minds hearts souls and bodies today and i pray this in the mighty name of jesus amen wow what a word family did you take notes i know i took notes and if this touched you and i know it did then you need to do the following. See, we've been called to bring supernatural transformation to our world one person at a time. And it gets no easier than literally sharing this with a friend or family or anyone you can think of. So take the link, copy paste it anywhere and make sure that someone else is blessed through this today. Also, we want to take a moment to thank you. This online platform has proven to be a blessing beyond even what we could imagine. And we've seen lives touched and transformed through these sermons and through everything we've been doing online. And thank you for being a part of that, whether it's through financially giving or through praying with us or whatever it is you've been able to do. And we want to encourage you to keep doing it. Help us bring that transformation to a world that so desperately needs it. And also, family, if you want to get in contact with us, our details are on the screen. We can't wait to hear from you. With all of that said, goodbye and God bless you.